on KPFA 89.3, KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online at kpfa.org. Stay tuned, because Terra Berta is coming up. From the Amazon Basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. And I'm Michelle Chan, and welcome to Terra Verde on this, the first day of 2016. Well, to start the year off right here at Terra Verde, we've dug into some of our archives to select a few segments that we hope will spark some green New Year's resolutions. From clothing yourself in local organic fiber, to virtually eliminating plastic from your household, to starting your own environmental initiative. Here are some guests who've inspired us over the years, and we hope their stories will inspire you in 2016. Our first segment comes from a show a few winters ago on sustainable fibers. You've heard of eating local, but wearing local? Let's take a listen to an interview with Rebecca Burgess, founder of Fibershed, about her journey to wear local and allow others to do the same. In 2011, I attempted to wear uh, local, so within 150 miles of my home, I wanted to create a resource-based understanding and map who and what was in this region. And really, it's a one-day drive in my biodiesel car from the coast of California inland and back. So I knew that I could really start building relationships with farmers and ranchers, and that's why I chose 150 miles. There happened to be an alpaca ranch I was really interested in working with. It was 147 miles from my front door. And so um, I would bring, you know, graduates from CCA, California College of the Arts, um, a lot of those folks, uh, young people, would come with me in, like, long car drives. And I would deliver these young students to the ranches, and we'd get raw alpaca fiber or um, raw sheep's wool and angora, you know, from rabbits or even a little cashmere from goats. And the students would, you know, manipulate those materials into something that I could wear. And so everything from my socks to my underwear to my bathing suit for one year was all locally grown. Um, and in doing that, I recognized the value of well-constructed garments. Not all of mine were. I also recognized the value of fine-gauge yarns, um, yarns that could really be constructed into garments that you can move in. It was very hard to go running or do yoga or do the things that modern people do when all of your garments have are very bulky. <laughs> and so I, I started to really recognize that there are... There's the raw fiber in plenty in our region. It was a matter of fine gauge spinning and processing that we were missing. It was the value addition. And and it it, was, it came home so hard that I thought, you know, this is going to be my path to really help these raw materials get onto human skin. And the way to do that is through inspiring mills, through inspiring processing techniques that we have all but vanquished from our state and our region, and they need to return. So it's it's launched me in a very passionate direction because there's nothing like wearing scratchy hand spun underwear for a year to motivate you. People have heard of watersheds and food sheds, perhaps, and we're also extending that bioregional perimeter to fiber. And in doing so, um, these relationships have start to be have started to precipitate between urban designers and rural agrarians. And there's a producer program that our nonprofit runs, and it includes artisans, designers, farmers, ranchers. And um, we initially started, you know, I literally drove people to each other's uh, locations if they didn't have cars to make the initial introductions. But now people are off and running, and they've got relationships built. And those relationships are precipitating garments. Uh, literally, you can start to clothe yourself. Um, we started a lot with simple accessories, um, things like wool scarves and hats and things you could, you know, hand spin off of wool from a sheep's back. 
Um, and then, you know, that extended and that story and narrative continues. Um, Sally has been very instrumental in working with artisans because she's been able to get her cotton spun and um, into a weavable yarn. And so people have been able to weave. And I've seen some really beautiful woven goods starting to come out of our fiber shed, which means really strong cloth for things like pants and shirts. So in the immediate sense, you know, this these relationships are just emerging in the last couple of years. They're really starting to garner some steam. But you can buy, you know, oak gall dyed, um, color grown cotton shirts. You can clothe yourself in Tamales Bay wool sweaters and Toyon dyed um you know, tea hats. There's there are small but emerging possibilities and uh, we as the supply chain continues to emerge, um, more and more offerings will emerge. And again, that was Rebecca Burgess, founder of Fiber Shed, who was featured on Terra Verde a couple of winters ago. Rebecca has done most of the hard work for you, even wearing scratchy underwear for a year. So hopefully her story will inspire you to dress a little more local this year. And you can locate Fiber Shed retailers in Northern California by visiting Fibershed.com. Our second segment comes from my 2012 interview with Beth Terry, author of My Plastic Free Life. Beth's amazing story is inspiring for anyone thinking of cutting down on their plastic use in 2016. So let's take a listen to Beth's story. Well, five years ago, I hadn't heard about any of this um, problem of plastic in the ocean. And one night I was browsing the Internet and I stumbled across an article on the problem. Um, And what shocked me was a photo that I saw of a dead albatross chick that was completely full of plastic pieces. And for some reason, I had seen lots of other environmental photos and environmental documentaries before, but that picture um, really made a connection for me because the chick was full of bottle caps and everyday plastic pieces that I personally was using on an everyday basis. And I thought, I'm contributing to this problem, and I hadn't even known it existed. So... I just thought, thought, what would it be like to try to live without acquiring any new plastic? Um, it, I just thought it would be a fun experiment. And um, I also wanted to know what my plastic footprint was. So I set up a bag under my kitchen table, and I just started collecting all my plastic waste every week. Um, my husband, I think, was a little amused by this, maybe, in the beginning. Um, and I started a blog, which is now myplasticfreelife.com in order to track my progress and also to share all the plastic-free alternatives that I discovered. And um, last year, I turned it all, all the information I had gathered into a book, Plastic Free, so that um, other people wouldn't have to do all the research that I'd already done to try to get plastic out of their lives. And tell me, what did you find during that kind of first week of inventory? <laughs> Um, I actually list out a lot of the things um, that I found in the book, but it was mostly food wrappers. Um, there were lots. I was basically living on convenience foods, on um, frozen microwavable dinners in plastic trays and energy bars wrapped in plastic and things like that because I didn't want to have to cook. And so at the end of that first week, um, I had a an array in front of me of just all kinds of wrappers and containers and bottles. But the thing was, um, those were all things that I already had. I was using up what I already had. Most of it wasn't brand new. If I was still living the way I had been, it probably would have been a lot bigger. Right. And so... Um you actually are an accountant by profession, so that I think ended up maybe contributing to really fastidious documentation. Fastidious is a good word. Yeah. So on your blog now, you actually have pictures of your weekly plastic footprint. Yeah. And um, what kind of reaction have you gotten from people? The reaction has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, There are so many people in this world who now are aware of the problem, you know, thanks to groups like Five Gyres and Algalita and all the organizations that are bringing the the issue to the masses, but people don't realize that they can be part of the solution. So when they find my blog and they find all kinds of alternatives that they hadn't known existed, um, it's really exciting for them. I mean, I even found plastic-free mascara. No. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) What's some of the, I mean... I think everybody thinks of 
plastic bags. All right, you know, right. that's an easy, that's kind of an easy one. And a lot of us maybe even have several tote bags <laughs> at our house. That's easy. What's sort of the next step? Um, pl- and plastic bags were my first step, um, in fact. And I have a whole chapter in the book about plastic bags because for a lot of people, um, still, you know, they still forget their bags in the car. They forget to bring them in. They forget to have them with them. Um, so that is definitely the first step. The second step for me was bottles, plastic bottles. And so I got a reusable stainless steel bottle. Um, as you can see, I carry around a stainless steel travel mug with me wherever I go because it's just so versatile. And I just stopped buying anything that came in a plastic bottle after that. I still sometimes have trouble with caps because there are certain products that come in glass, but they still have a plastic cap and it might be something that I need. So there are some areas where I still haven't gotten the plastic completely out. Um, I have had to think about things in a, in a very different way, and Google has been my best friend in this effort, um, because if something exists and it's plastic-free, I'll probably be able to find it on the Internet. Um, there are shampoo bars that are just like a bar of soap, except it's shampoo, and also um, conditioner bars. There are deodorant bars. There are um, all kinds of things that you can get that are not in plastic. And also... Um, there's a source, a resource called Etsy, E-T-S-Y dot com, which is a lot of individual craftspeople who are selling the things that they make. And so there are people selling things that they've sewn or knitted or personal care products that they've made, lots of natural things. And that's where I actually found the plastic-free mascara. I found a mascara that comes in a little metal tin. It's a cake like they used to have in the old days. You put it, you use the same wand. So the wand or the brush is plastic, but you just just keep using the same one. You can wash it. And um, you just add a little bit of water to it and run the brush through it. It works. It works really well. Um, so, <laughs> well, that, that is great because I mean, you do you do try to get the you know natural products in the you know in the personal care aisle, and they pretty much are all in they plastic. Are. So and yeah, I, you, you know, try to do the right thing, and you, you're still stymied sometimes. Yeah, well, and that's you know that's a really ironic thing that we haven't really talked about, but um, the idea of organic and especially organic food packaged in plastic is just so ironic to me because we go through all this effort to create organic food that doesn't have chemical um, fertilizers and pesticides that are endocrine disruptors, um, and then we package it in something that could potentially be leaching hormone-disrupting chemicals back into the food. And what a lot of people don't realize, they want to know what are the safe plastics. And I discuss this in my book. Um, There are chemicals we know about, like bisphenol A and phthalates, which are problematic. Um, But some of the substitutes for bisphenol A are being shown to be endocrine disruptors as well. And what's more, um, any particular plastic product can contain a myriad of additives, additives that affect the strength, the hardness, the slipperiness, the antibacterial qualities even. And the problem is that manufacturers are not required to disclose to the public what any of those additives are. It's proprietary information. And so without knowing what's in plastic, we can't know what's going to leach out of it. And so we can't know as consumers if it's really safe. And so that's why I hesitate to tell anybody that there's any truly safe plastic when it comes to the chemicals in it. You have been doing fantastic. I've looked at your plastic, your weekly plastic tally, and over the summer there have been literally, you know, weeks where you consumed no plastic except for, like, the plastic window, which was on one of the envelopes (laughs) that came on a bill that came to your house. I mean, so... For folks that, um, and you know, I've, I've, done, done, I've yeah. done a lot to try to reduce my mail so that I don't have so many of those. But <laughs> no, yeah, literally, literally, like a piece of packing tape that came on, you yeah. know, came on something. Yeah. So it's incredibly inspirational. Part of what I have learned through this process is to actually value the things that I have a lot more and to take care of them and to try to make them last longer. And so a few of the strategies that I have for um, purchasing or acquiring things that are durable items, not necessarily disposable, but things like electronics or, um, you know, clothing or anything that I might actually need to have, um, I've developed lots of strategies, and so some are to acquire things secondhand, to borrow instead of necessarily having to buy and own things myself, but also to fix things. And on my blog, I've talked about fixing a hairdryer, a rice cooker, an umbrella. I even fixed my (laughs) my washing machine. I had to get in there and stomp on it to get the basin to come out, but... um, 
when you when you learn how to take care of things and fix them instead of always having to buy new things, it really makes you feel self sufficient and it gives you a lot of self confidence. I have to say, so there are lots of really great reasons for doing this that have nothing to do with the environment. It just has to do with making our lives better. And that was Beth Terry, author of My Plastic Free Life. Uh, she was on the show a couple of years ago and was definitely an inspiring guest from my perspective. You can get more tips on how to go plastic free at Beth's website, which is myplasticfreelife.com. And it also includes Beth's top 100 steps to get started on a plastic free journey. And beyond the easier stuff like using cloth grocery bags, she provides tons of do it yourself recipes, for example, that I allow you to avoid buying window cleaner or shampoo or even glue, which even the natural stuff can come in one use plastic bottle. So um, Beth's uh, website and resources really um, has lots of advanced pro tips. So this is perfect for all of you out there who want to set a 2016 New Year's resolution to reduce plastic use. Our final segment comes from an episode produced by Adrian Fitch Frank Frankel uh, in 2015 called Deepening Your Green, Starting Your Own Environmental Initiative. And Adrian spoke with Kelly Carlisle, founder of a relatively new environmental nonprofit called Acta Nonverba. She talked with Kelly on how she got started and the advice that she would provide to others who want to do the same. This clip starts with Kelly describing the Acta Non Verba Urban Farm. So Acta Non Verba Youth Urban Farm Project uh, works with youth age 5 to 13 um, on our quarter acre farm in um, Oakland, California. The um, kids plan, plant, harvest, and sell the produce, and 100% of those, uh, of those funds go into savings accounts for them. All right, and you also have um, uh, camps that you do? Yes, Camp A and V. Um, we just expanded last year from spring break camp and um, an eight-week uh, summer camp to a two-week camp in the winter and a one-week camp in the fall. All right, and uh, and also you have a CSA. Yes, a tiny little CSA uh, from our organically grown farm. Um, we have about five to ten customers a season. All right, so what does CSA stand for and what what is it? It's a community-supported agriculture and um, community members purchase shares in our farm um, so that we know what to what to grow and that we have a captive audience to buy it. All right. So, Kelly, what was the catalyst? What made you start this initiative? Well, I was really... Um, disturbed uh, in August 2010 by the statistic that almost 40% of youth in uh, Oakland, California drop out of school. Um, it was um, a, a shock, um, especially having a young daughter myself. Um, it occurred to me that we don't, we live in Berkeley, but we don't live in a bubble. Um, the kids that, the same children that are not being um, invested in, in deep East Oakland and West Oakland are going to have interactions with with my child and it's really um, irresponsible to see a problem and not try to address it. How did you find the time to start your initiative as a volunteer, you know, juggling it with other demands on your life, Kelly? Um, I just got rid of some other things. <laughs> <laughs> I figured out how to how to make time. Um, it really it became a passion for me. Um, it was as important to me, you know, this this initiative, this program is as important to me as eating, as walking, as as reading. Um, I, I make time for it because there's no alternative. Um, our organization words are... The name of our organization, Acta Non Verba, is Latin for deeds, not words. And that's something that I believe all the way to my core. And, and you I often hear from parents, uh, you know, oh, I don't have time for that. What would you say to people like that? Well, I mean, <laughs> I can't tell anybody else what to do with their time. <laughs> but um, as a mom, um, it is it is difficult. My daughter is 10 now, and she often um, goes on record to say how hard it is to be the daughter of the executive executive director, um, you know, long suffering, <laughs> but, um, and it is, it is difficult, um, to make time for her, but when they're, when it's 
my daughter's time is her time, and when it's work time, it's work time. The next question is, what advice would you give to someone who's thinking of starting an environmental initiative? Kelly? Um, That is a um, challenging question um, because starting, starting this initiative was a lot more challenging than I had anticipated. I I thought that um, the fact that we were improving the quality of life for for children would bring supporters from everywhere and that the community themselves would be um, really engaged and excited about the the work that we're doing. Um, But I think my best advice would be if you if you have a vision and you and you really truly believe that it's something um that will make the planet the your community whatever it is better um you have to go for it and you have to stick with it um perseverance has been the only way that we've been able to make it these last 4 years um through perseverance, I'd say that you will get those supporters and you'll get the, the community to understand, um, the, you know, why this is a, a good initiative. But, yeah, I I just I'd caution anybody that's starting an initiative to really think about all that's going to um, need to happen to, to push that through. Definitely buy that book. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need specific qualifications before you start an environmental initiative? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> um, no, I um I think as as the other lady said, you know, having passion, you know, is one of the qualifications. Really, it, in my opinion, it can't be something that you're like, somebody should do something about that. I'm going to start this initiative and then it falls apart, you know, after a couple of years or or whatever. Um I think having sustainability on on the brain, you know, is definitely a number one uh, top of mind thing that I didn't think about until, you know, like year two when I was broke. So, you know, I think that having those, having the passion and having a eye to the future are probably two main qualifications to start an initiative. Did you do environmental work beforehand or what's your background before? No. Oh, no. Um, I I was a uh, uh, Navy for six and a half years, um, and then I worked at a corporation for three years, um, and I got laid off during the economic downturn, the the most recent one, um, and um, I, I think it was the best thing that ever happened. It opened up a lot of time and a lot of a lot of um, space for imagination to see not just you know what the economy was doing and how it affected my paycheck, but now that I didn't have a paycheck, I could really look around and see that there are larger issues than whether or not my 401k gets, you know, rolled over or whatnot, you know. Um, yeah, I, I certainly thought that environmentalists were just people with time on their hands <laughs> and I definitely like laughed at tree sitters you know <laughs> and now you know it's become more important uh, not just more important but imperative that we have environmentalists that speak out against GMOs and speak out against you know rat poison and killing Cooper's hawk I just actually saw a Cooper's hawk this summer at my farm and I was like well that's a Cooper's hawk <laughs> so yeah I think that it's important that young people become environmental stewards you know as they're coming up so there's not a big shock when they're 30 something and you look around and oh snap that hole in the ozone is actually a real thing i just wanted to um i just wanted to recommend that people that want to start an initiative read anything and everything about um the subject of your initiative as well as nonprofit work um i try to do half and half nonprofit work and urban farming when i'm doing my research and reading okay great that's very helpful um what are the things that you've learned that you found surprising that you'd like to share with other people who might be considering starting an environmental initiative? This entire industry has surprised me um, and and challenged me and humbled me in every single way possible. Um, Today, I ran into a little girl that was in our first camp back in 2012, and uh, she 
on her own, according to her mom, went online and looked up our organization, saw me sitting next to the president and said, I want to come back to your farm. And I just, I mean, that's so great. That's That was such an, um, a humbling experience just today. I mean, those that that shocks me every day how much um people trust me and trust me with their children how uh, as a mom how has that influenced uh, you the way you approach other parents about food issues in your community well i th- i think that um you have to be very gentle and very careful because I know that all moms are doing the best that they can, the best that they know how to do, the best that they they can afford to do. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, no one wants to feel like you know, you're, I'm feeding my child poison and how dare you, you know. So for me, with my daughter, it was like every year there was something new that I shouldn't have given her. Um, I shouldn't have given her uh, formula because of the crap in formula. I shouldn't have given her uh, apple juice because, you know, oh, there's arsenic in apple juice and there's too much sugar and, and whatnot. Um, I have to be very... Um, cautious and gentle when speaking with moms in our community about what their kids are eating. That actually spurred our um, our organization to come up with a healthy food and beverage policy whereby during our camps we serve the breakfast, lunch, and snacks. And again, you are listening to the voice of Kelly Carlisle, founder of Acta Non Verba Youth Urban Farm in Oakland. You can find them online at anvfarm.org. And as Kelly mentioned, with absolutely no previous environmental experience, she started Acta Non Verba a couple of years ago. Maybe in the past you start, you've thought about starting your own environmental initiative. And could 2016 be the year you get it off the ground? So there you have it, stories from three ordinary people who are doing extraordinary things for the planet, from helping to birth a local organic clothing market to virtually eliminating plastic from their lives to seeing a need in their community and starting an organization to address that need. I hope that these stories will inspire you to take your environmental commitment to the next level in 2016. Thanks for listening to Tara Verde and have a happy new year. You are listening to Terra Verde and KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. Economist Richard Wolff provides immediate clarity and depth with a tasty rye edge. KPFA is delighted to present Richard with his new reliably discerning talk on February 10th, Wednesday evening, 730 at Berkeley's First Congregational Church, 2345 Channing Way. This KPFA benefit is wheelchair accessible. Richard will be hosted by Sabrina Jacobs, whose unique show, A Rude Awakening, airs Monday afternoons on KPFA. Advanced tickets available at brownpapertickets.com and at supporting independent bookstores. For this rye evening with a great economist, cutting through the bull fruit, offering a positive outlook, February 10th. This is Philip Mulderie, host of The Sunday Show. Join me and my guests every Sunday morning, 9 to 11. We'll be talking about politics. We'll be talking about the state of things around us. Plus, we open the phones to your called-in questions and comments. That's every Sunday morning, The Sunday Show, on community-powered KPFA. KPFA.